Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Recent Advances for Simultaneous Analysis to Determine Embryo, PGTA, and PGTM Status with NGS. I am Jennifer Woods of Labrys and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labrys and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more, visit thermofisher.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Jingus Gianolu, PhD, Founder and CEO of NextGen Genetics. Uh, Dr. Gianolu, you may now begin your presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Jengis Gianolu, and I would like to thank Thermo Fisher for having me to discuss the most recent advances, uh, advances in PGTA and pre implantation genetic testing world. So this is my disclosure. Um, I'm a founder and the CEO of NextGen Genetics. Um, today, I would like to cover uh, these topics. Uh, first, I would like to start uh, PGTA technologies, and I would like to mainly focus on reprosic verification. And I would like to also talk about one of the recent most hot topic about embryo mosaicism and how we are able to able to do this uh, analytical testing with the reprosic platform and we will also go over a little bit the uh, the cut of values to um, to understand how the embryo mosaicism called in the field and then we will we will review a few papers related to those uh, topics um, and uh, towards at the end of the talk um, i will be mainly talking about advantages of using reprosic platform and uh, compared to others that are currently available in our field um, once the PGTA talk is done, then I would like to change its subject to pre-implantation genetic testing for single gene disorders. And first, I would like to actually start with current testing platform that I have been uh, utilized in our field. And I will start with the linkage analysis with the short tandem repeat, and then continue with the carrier mapping. This is SNP-based array technology. And But I would like to mainly focus on NGS-based PGTM with PGT6 and uh, how we verify the technology through actually Thermo Fisher platform. And at the end again, I will also discuss the advantage of using this PGT6 uh, over any other current platform that are util utilized in the field. So again, I'd like to start with the pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy and explain the most recent advances in our, in our actual field. So I put this slide just to give you a little bit an idea about NGS platform. So um, there's probably a misconception in our field. There is not only one NGS platform uh, uh, in the field. There are actually multiple of them. Each actually uh, technology actually come up with the brilliant idea to be able to sequence samples. Um, some of the actually technologies actually has a high throughput, but actually low coverage or low actually the reading versus some of the actual other technology has uh, low throughput, but has a high actually sequencing grid. So it depends on actually um, our needs. There are multiple like NGS platform uh, that are currently uh, in, 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 in the field. Uh, but when it comes to pre-implantation genetic testing, there aren't a lot, and there are only few platform that has the full solution, which I will discuss. Uh, Reprosic platform uh, is going to be one of my main topic uh, today. So before actually I jump into the NGS technology and how the NGS works, first I would like to quickly go over how we do the testing in an embryonic level. So as we all know, uh, when the embryo actually ready in the blastocyst stage uh, for biopsy, uh, the embryo has a two main compartment. One of them is inner cell mass, which is eventually going to be uh, the, the baby, and also the trophectoderm, which is this is going to be eventually placenta of the baby. So what we know is that removing few cells from trophectoderm, it doesn't harm the embryo. And by getting few cells from this uh, part, 
we will be able to understand the genetic makeup of those embryos. But as we all know, each cell contains approximately six picogram of DNA, which if five or six cells are removed from the refractor, we don't have actually enough DNA to start with to use in any platform. So in order to, for us to be able to actually increase the DNA yield, we actually use a technology called whole genome amplification. So once we get those few cells from uh, biopsied embryos, we first lyse the cell, and then once the DNA is available, we actually do the amplification to be able to increase the yield thousands of thousands of times that we can use the any platform uh, for the genetic testing. So once we actually DNA is available, then what we do is we actually fragment the DNA in small pieces, and they are approximately 100 to 200 base pairs. And we'll put like small adapters that allow us to be able to start sequencing the library. And those, each small fragment will be actually sequenced millions of millions of times. And at the end, we will actually get all the small pieces and compare to reference DNA, which has come from the Human Genome Project, to be able to understand copy number for each chromosome uh, for an embryonic level. So one of the actually advantages with next generation sequencing that we did not have before with other platforms such as ArrayCGH or SNP array is the barcoding. If you think about actually next generation sequencing has been around for the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, but previously we were using um, in, the, in the early, sta uh, early uh, stage of this genetic testing analysis, we used to use actually a fish technology, fluorescent in-situ hybridization. But of course, this is not molecular approach. When we move to molecular approach, we start using a ray CGH or SNP array. And I believe they did a really good job in the past. The only problem with those uh, platforms, uh, we did not have actually barcoding system that we can actually uh, do simultaneous analysis, multiple samples in the same reaction. With the next generation sequencing, we are actually able to barcode every single sample. And initially we had, we were able to only mix up 24 sample and we were able to sequence them in parallel. But now we are able to actually um, barcode 96 samples. And after the barcoding, we can pull all of them in a single tube and we can do parallel sequencing for each sample, which reduces the cost significantly. Um, one of the other big advantage with next generation sequencing is the higher dynamic range. Now, just because of the higher resolution, we used to actually call the embryos normal or abnormal, like as if everything is black and white, which we know that when it comes to biology, nothing is in black and white. Now with this due to higher dynamic range, we are able to also look at the mosaic status of the embryos. Although we are calling like mosaic status, but some scientists would like to use intermediate results, or some scientists would like to use pathetic mosaic. So, but whatever we call them now, due to with these newer technologies, with the NGS, we are able to, again, not only call aneuploidy and euploidy, but also on the status of the embryos as well. And again, due to higher resolution, we can also identify small segmental rearrangements, which help us to be able to also do all the testing for a translocation uh, cases. And like, as I mentioned, one of the important part is also the cost. And now compared to any other uh, previous platforms, such as RACGH or SNP array, um, the cost is significantly lower with uh, next generation sequencing. With, with that, actually, many actually people actually will have an access to those such technologies. So, till recently, we were discussing whether or not PGTA should be actually uh, should be used uh, in a, in our field. Um, and but I think this discussion pretty much is over now. The question is not really. Um, whether or not we should be using PGTA technology for uh, embryo or any other uh, analysis. The, 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 uh, the other question is how does NGS technology can actually address those mosaic embryos, which is intermediate results where they are not normal and they are not abnormal. Now, before we jump into the mosaic embryo analysis, I would like to just go over what is mosaic embryos. By definition, finding more than one distinct chromosomal count in a sample. And the reason of those mosaic embryos, it could be either due to anaphaslac or mitotic misex segregation of the chromosome or premature cell division before the DNA replication. So the timing of the missegregation it also affects the severity of the mosaic embryos. And, and if you look at actually from the published paper, incidence of euploid, aneuploid, and mosaicism varying as low as 2% 
and as high as 30% in the blastocyst stage. Uh, what we know actually, even from perinatal specimen, um, amniotic, we, we are finding up to 0.25% in amniotic fluid and also up to 2% in chronic villi sampling. So the mosaicism definitely effect. Now, we still have actually a lot of unknown about uh, mosaic embryos. Like as I said, some scientists doesn't want to necessarily want to call those mosaic embryos as a mosaic. They want to call them intermediate result, which I would not disagree with this. Because when we call them mosaic embryos, we don't even really know how many embryos are truly mosaic. Uh, how those biopsy correlate to those inner cell mass. And also how does actually uh, the, the biopsies is actually affect even overall mosaic embryos. Um, the way that we grow the embryos or handling the embryos doesn't really impact the overall mosaic results. And when we transfer those mosaic embryos and when we have a, a healthy babies, are they really truly normal? So with this actually today webinar, we'll kind of try to answer some of those questions uh, that we just like listed in here. So before we talk like, about like a day five embryo mosaicism, I would like to actually quickly touch base on mosaicism on day three. Um, till recently, all the, the genetic testing effort was done on day three embryo development. Um, and ideally in day, day three embryo development, you have a typically eight cells, and just by chance, one cell may divide abnormally. And in case the biopsy is done with this purple cell, which is the aneuploid cell, and the result obviously will come abnormal. Whereas just by chance, if the euploid cell was removed, the result will come like normal. But if you look at actually this scenario, in both cases, the result is correct, but both of them doesn't represent the whole embryo just because of this embryo mosaicism. In fact, in the past, when we uh, were doing day three biopsy, and then we were doing grief analysis on day three, in some cases, we were finding the abnormal result was corrected on day five. And I don't believe the result was corrected. I don't think the embryo is gonna be suddenly smart and try to correct by himself. I think what happens is that if the euploid embryo is removed, and the sister cells is the only one is going to remain in the embryo. So by removing the aneuploid cells, we're basically cleaning the embryo. And if the sister cells is died out in some point, the embryo will have only good cells, which is euploid cells, cell lines. And if you ever do another biopsy in day five or in day six, the result will come back normal. Now, the question is, is the technology is incorrect? Or it's just like biology is kind of giving us those uh, results, uh, which unfortunately cause the either false negative or false positive results. So I think we really did good job when we were doing day three biopsies. Not that I'm suggesting that we should go back to day three biopsies, uh, but I think um, if you look at what's happening with day five biopsies, I don't think a lot of things have changed since then uh, when it comes to embryo mosaicism. And I remember in when we were doing day three biopsies, we were hearing actually from scientific paper 15% of those uh, day three embryos are mosaic. So we decided to actually stop doing day three biopsies just because of it's only a single cell and we moved to day five biopsy because we believe that uh, the mosaicism on day five is definitely less. Um, but if you look at actually uh, those scenarios, um, the mosaicism actually uh, can be uh, kind of uh, be different in for each scenarios. So in some cases, trophectoderm could be affected, but not the ICM in their cell mass or sometimes half of the ICM is affected, but not the trophectoderm, or in some cases only trophectoderm affected, but not the ICM. So unfortunately, we are still facing those embryo mosaics even on day, day five, uh, the, embryo, um, the embryo development. And in fact, those kind of scenarios were well, well studied in the, the Kapavos and his colleague uh, with the 2016 paper. He showed that some of the actually mosaicism can be reciprocal, some of them can be um, uniform, so it depends actually which part of the embryo is taken. Obviously, we we're not going to touch the, the annual cell mass for obvious reasons, but we still actually have chance to uh, be uh, getting those mosaic cell lines and which may or may not represent the whole embryo. Now, if the embryo mosaicism is, that has a high frequency, then the question is why we are doing even the testing in the first place? What we know actually, if the biopsy represents the whole embryo, PGTA result is extremely accurate. In fact, a paper that was published in 2010, it's a little bit like old paper, 
uh, but I am also one of the co-author in this paper. And we actually did the study from with the donated embryos where um, we did it, uh, the analysis by removing inner cell mass from the embryo and, and the leftover embryo was split in two to be able to look at those concordance rates between trophectoderms and trophectoderm and ICM concordance rate. With that specific paper, um, when we look at the trophectoderm biopsies, we found 100% concordance between all the trophectoderm results. But when we compared the trophectoderm result with inner cell mass, we found 96.1% concordance rate, which was quite high. Um, and also that kind of tells us this genetic testing working in the membranic level. But what we also find that 3.9% of the time, the trophectoderm may not present the whole inner cell mass and the rest of the embryo, which unfortunately it may cause false negative or false, or false positive. But unfortunately, those are the reality that we have to live with. Now, a little bit actually more uh, kind of review about embryo mosaicism. So what we know actually, uh, when it comes to embryo mosaicism or those intermediate results, um, there are different algorithms and different kind of values may impact the overall result. Um, if the cutoff values is very low or high, then the mosaic embryo result will kind of differ depending on where you put the cutoff. And with that said, that PGA really helped the, to our IVF goal. And again, the same question, when we actually call an embryo is mosaic or intermediate result or potato mosaic, are they really all actually mosaic? Uh, and what is the technical contribution? And where do we go from there? Um, now, what we know is actually there is another research field that's already started for the last few years in non-invasive pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, which is, this is not the today topic, but uh, based on those new research, uh, the, the culture media where the embryos actually go may have a better representation of the whole embryo rather than just removing few cells from trophectoderm. Now, I would like to actually go a little bit deep inside of this like embryo mosaicism call and how those actually the call was made uh, based on uh, different genetic labs. Um, so it's not actually about the like when you, when we make the, the mosaic embryo call. This is not about mainly uh, which gen, uh, NGS platform we are using. It is mainly depend of the uh, the operator and the, the cutoff values. Uh, in some labs, you may have the cutoff value anywhere between. Two lower cutoff is 20 and higher cutoff is 80. And on the other hand, some other cutoff values goes to anywhere from 30 to 70. So obviously, if you go with those lower cutoff versus higher cutoff, then there is 10% 10, 10 like a clear difference in here. And if you are using lower cutoff, obviously you will have more mosaic embryos or more intermediate results. Again, what we know is that obviously NGS platform has definitely some kind of uh, impact on the overall result, but the lab protocols, cutter values, algorithm, whole genome amplification protocol, all unfortunately contribute to our embryo mosaicism call. And as far as I know, there is not really kind of really standardization in our field. And when you look at all the papers that are recently published, varying cutoffs let the percentage of the mosaic embryo supported anywhere from 5% to 20%. And if you think about 5 to 20%, there are 15% differences. So the embryo mosaicism call. Now, I would like to actually um, uh, quickly touch base on PGDIS guideline. And in 2016, PGDIS actually um, published uh, the guideline for um, transferring mosaic embryos. Um, but if you look at their um, recommendation, I pretty much agree with uh, everything that they actually uh, recommended. And they um, uh, recommend only transfer mosaic embryos if the couple's uh, patient doesn't have any alternative embryo exists. And transferring mosaic embryos should be done only with uh, with proper genetic counseling. Um, but the disagreement that I have actually, this is my, my personal opinion, is the technical cutoff. So initial cutoff values actually was given. The 20% or less should be considered normal. And anytime there is elevation from over 20% all the way to 80%, that's where we're considering a mosaic calls or intermediate result, and anything more than 80% should be considered abnormal. And they actually give also some uh, transfer priority should be given to uh, mosaic monosomy for obvious reason, with a few exception over the trisomic uh, embryos. But in 2019, 
the same PGDI uh, guideline actually had the pretty much everything same remained the same except the technical cutoff values is actually changed from 20 percent to 40 percent in my opinion 20 percent was low cutoff and we need to keep in mind that all the technologies that we are using are not perfect uh, especially whole genome amplification and time to time or embryo biopsy may contribute unfortunately those kind of like noisy noisy actually reading and having 20 percent cutoff um, may be confused actually with mosaicism call. Uh, but at the same time, uh, PGDIS in 2019, actually they increased the, the lower cutoff values to from 20% to 40%. In my opinion, again, 20% was low, and I believe 40% is high. Part of the reason is that uh, probably we're going to start to see more implantation failure if the couple ever transfer those mosaic embryos. And um, because or with the implantation failure or actually implantation with uh, some miscarriage due to the high cutoff uh, holes on those uh, embryos. Now, I would like to actually kind of slightly uh, switch the, the subject from those mosaic embryo holes to analytical verification that we have done with the, uh, by the research base with the corial cell lines. Uh, to actually look at the Reprosic uh, protocol with Thermo Fisher. Um, what we did was in our laboratory, we actually purchased Corial cell lines. Those are commercially available. And uh, there are plenty actually normals and abnormals, normal fails and, and normal female um, the cell line that can be actually used uh, for the analytical verification. And here in this slide, you could see actually two profiles. So I would like to start the ones on the top. This is actually normal 46XX normal female that we purchased from Korea. So with this profile, I would like to explain to you what you are seeing in here. With the X axis, you would see the number goes from, embryo, from chromosome one all the way to chromosome 22. And then we have the six of the, M, uh, the cell line, which is in this case is X and X. If you look at the Y axis, uh, the number goes from zero all the way to 3.5. So in order to, for us to call anything is normal, we need to have uh, two copies. One copy come from maternal side and one copy come from paternal side. And any deviation from those numbers will be considered abnormal. So obviously those are actually a control sample. We know what they are. We actually removed a few cells from those um, corial cell lines and pretend uh, as if they are like single cell or two cells or five cells. And we run them on our reprocessing protocol and we were able to get a uh, picture perfect uh, nice, clear, uh, normal male and female. If you look at the second one, actually, this one is the normal male. The only difference, obviously, between normal male and female is the, there is an extra Y chromosome in the uh, male profile. And again, all the chromosomes are listed in here. Those are picture perfect, two copies for every single chromosome. Now, yes, we can detect the normal and uh, uh, male or female. Now, the question is, how are we going to be able to detect those uh, abnormal uh, cell lines? Again, we also purchased uh, corial cell lines abnormal uh, for analytical verification. And um, we actually had monosomy X. As you can see in here, in the circle in the first picture, we have two copies for every single chromosome, except there is only one X and there is no Y. We also had um, some chromosome where there was an addition. And in this case, we have a trisomy 13. As you guys know, um, when we have an addition, um, those are actually indication for trisomy, and there is a missing chromosome, those are indication for monosomy. So with the second example, the ones in the middle has 47 chromosome, and there is a trisomy 13, and instead of having two copies, there are actually three copies. Again, those are really, really nice crystal clear uh, uh, picture perfect uh, profiles. Um, those are good actually DNA quality and when you have actually very nice good DNA quality those technologies pretty much always works and the last one is actually trisomy 18 where there's an addition for chromosome 18 and it's also depicted with the uh, blue circle uh, at the end now we are able to detect those full gain or losses but how about those segmental errors are we able to detect those segmental errors we also purchased uh, some of the corial cell lines that has those segmental errors for analytical verification purpose uh, with, rep with reprocessing protocol. Uh, the first one, actually, as you can see, uh, it's for the 6XY and there's a duplication on, on chromosome 3. 
and this is approximately 62.2 uh, megabase uh, duplication. And uh, as you can see in here, the, 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 on the chromosome three, it is not, there is no complete gain, it's just like part of the segment is duplicated. Uh, but if you look at actually the second one, we said like, what is our resolution? Like how low we can go, and we will be still able to detect those deletions or duplications. If you look at the, the, the second example where that we have a deletion on chromosome 18, that specific cell line had seven megabase deletion. And as you can see in here, we can still detect those seven megabase resolution, which is quite high, good resolution. And the last one is uh, on the chromosome uh, nine, then in the P-arm, there is actually duplication, and we were also able to detect with the four megabase uh, duplication for segmental errors. Um, being able to take those segmental is really important because we will be able to uh, also address those some of the translocation cases that happens uh, in the uh, IVF world. Perfect. Now we are now we know we can detect those full gain or losses, and we can detect the segmentals. But now the question is, how about uh, how about um, mosaic calls? Are we going to be able to uh, detect those? So what we did was, in order to address this mosaicism detection, we did also again analytical verification by artificially mixed corial cell lines. Because from corial cell lines, you cannot really buy uh, mosaic cell lines. I mean, there are actually some mosaic uh, cell lines that are uh, currently available, but we wanted to do the control analysis where we mixed up two cell lines that we know what they are. And if you look at the, with the first example, we had trisomy 13, XY 30%, and trisomy 18, we put 70%. And again, this is not my actually real software, but if I had the real software, if we actually zoom in, in every single chromosome, you would be able to see the percentage wise, whether or not they are 30% mosaic or 70% mosaicism. We also mixed two and other two different cell lines where we had monosomy X and normal XY. We mixed up with 50, 50%. And you can see the gender, how they look like. There are look like two copies of X and then one copy of Y, uh, Y chromosome. And then we also mixed up 50-50 with trisomy 13 and 18. And with all the kind of like experiment that we did, uh, we actually convinced ourselves that those mosaicism detection can be done with reprocess. Perfect. So one of the advantage of using reprocess is as follows. So the, the whole reprocess protocol takes approximately 16 hours. And we do only um, three hours hands-on, uh, which, um, which is kind of really good because less the human actually involvement is the, that means the less actually uh, the human uh, the, the error in our lab. So the two thirds of the workflow are pretty much done with the liquid handler, which is called Iron Chef and the sequencing device. And um, and this is the device that you can see in the right hand side. So this is the device that I'm just mentioning. Uh, once we have the three hours cell lysis and whole genome amplification protocol is completely done, uh, pretty much two the rest of the two door the workflow will be done with liquid handler and the, the sequencing device to be able to complete all the analysis. Uh, due to the high resolution, as I mentioned, we are able to actually detect all the segmental rearrangements uh, to address all the translocation cases. Um, but for me, is one of the big advantage of using ReproSeq is, uh, first of all, is uh, lab user friendly. Uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we are using uh, 96 samples in each run. And unlike the other platform, uh, we do not really have to measure every single DNA and normalize them and then uh, put them in the same actually tube to be able to do the, the in parallel sequencing. Uh, one of the big advantage with ReproSeq is once you do the whole genome amplification, you don't even have to measure every single DNA. You just take a liquid, which is five four microliter from each sample, and you pull them in a single tube, and that's how you kind of continue with the sequencing. Which if you think about like really measuring 96 samples, and once you get the measurement, if you have to really do the dilution uh, based on their measurement, uh, it takes a lot of time and effort, and the problem there will be a lot of human errors with those, this process. Um, the other also big advantage with Reprosic is there is a detailed chromosome analysis. 
Uh, and with this actually software, where there is an optional actually embryo mosaicism called with the uh, ion reporter software. And again, one of the most important things, as I mentioned, the less human involvement, that means the less error due to this liquid handler, which called lab uh, ion chef. One of other big advantage with Reprosic is um, uh, the integration. Um, as you can imagine, every time we sequence an embryo or any sample, we get like massive data. We get a lot of information. Um, obviously, we cannot really enter those like manually. So the integration for us was, was really crucial. And uh, with actually Ion Reporter with Thermo Fisher, um, they have actually a very nice integration system that whichever uh, database that you use, uh, due to their integration system, you can easily actually transfer all the information automatically uh, to your database that you don't actually have to type or you have to actually write anything the way that we used to do in, in the past. So as you can see here, the ones actually on the top, this is all a database. And for each embryo that we get result, they will be automatically dumped into uh, the, the database that we are using. And obviously we still check uh, all the result against uh, the profile that we received just to make sure that we are not missing anything or nothing has been actually missed during those uh, transfers. Again, I want to bring this actually video again because this is one of my favorite device and I just want to play the, the video again. Um, this is liquid handler and called the Iron Chef. This protocol takes approximately five hours from the beginning all the way to the end. Uh, which takes a lot of burden uh, from any lab. Uh, but one of the actually big advantage with the system is uh, you can actually customize or you can program this robot based on your lab workflow. Like for instance, um, when the, the whole uh, run is completed five hours later, uh, that chip that uh, needs to be actually transferred to the next generation sequencing platform. Uh, but if you don't have any person um, when the, the run is completed, then what you could do is actually with this IHF, you can program this to overnight running and then you can program it for following day in the morning. So the device will work all day along, all night along. And then when you come back to the lab, the, the, the chip will be ready actually to, to upload to, to next generation sequencing device. Um, another good thing about with those devices, as long as you kind of do the maintenance, a those device doesn't have a good days and bad days. Uh, unlike the human being. And uh, just because of those devices, uh, the human error rate will be significantly reduced or minimized. Okay, so after all this reprocessing information, I would like to review a couple papers uh, that uh, I would like to go over in terms of the concordance rate between inner cell mass and trophectoderm and concordance rate between mosaic embryo calls and the mosaic embryo transfer and some of the uh, outcomes. So this is one of the most recent papers, like as I mentioned earlier, um, although we did not have a lot of data point at the beginning, now with this re uh, recent uh, few papers, now we have actually more information about those uh, uh, cutoff values and the mosaic embryo transfer. And I would like to start with the paper that was published with, with Dr. Uh, Viotti and in the 2020 in his colleague. Um, they use the cutoff values about 20 to 80%. Like as I mentioned, 20% uh, could be uh, a little bit low end, uh, but that's what uh, the paper actually mentioned. Their, uh, the cutoff is anywhere between 20 and 80. And they were able to also categorize those embryos, low mosaic or high mosaic. Low mosaic means if the cells has like less than 50% or more than 40% of those uneploid samples, uneploid actually cells in the embryo, and that's how they were categorized. Um, if you look at the overall uh, results, and the euploid embryo has a better actually uh, the, um, better outcome compared to combined mosaic embryos or single chromosome mosaicism, uh, which is kind of expected. Um, when you look at the spontaneous abortion uh, with the uh, euploid embryos, it's about about eight percent, but with the any mosaic uh, embryo transfer. The, uh, the outcome was slightly was higher when it comes to spontaneous abortion, which is 20.4% and 25%. And in this paper, um, they categorize the embryos in two sites. One is lower mosaic, where um, we assume that lower mosaicism, meaning that we have more healthy cells compared to abnormal cells. 
And if the, if the embryo has actually more than 50% mosaicism, that means we have more abnormal cells and less actually healthy cells. And when the transfer was done, lower mosaicism versus higher mosaicism, and the implantation actually is significantly different between the lower mosaic embryos had a higher implantation and the ongoing pregnancy compared to higher mosaic embryos. Um, the assumption again with the lower mosaicism, we have like more healthy cells compared to abnormal cells. But one thing that I also want to emphasize or actually mention is that uh, if you have a low cutoff values like 20, um, of course I'm speculating, don't know the answers. Some of those low mosaic embryos may not be even actually mosaic in the first place. And that was the reason maybe we are getting some successful result from those uh, low mosaic uh, embryos um, compared to higher mosaic ones. And in the same paper, they looked at the, the embryo mosaicism type, whether or not low, high, whether or not they are complete chromosome gain or losses, or versus they are segmental mosaicism. And what they found with, specifically with this paper, segmental mosaic actually had the better outcome compared to um, any other actually full, full chromosome gain or losses. Um, but overall, combining with the mosaic level, whether or not high or low, and the type of the mosaicism, and whether or not this is full, full chromosome gain or losses, or segmental, and with the combination of embryo morphology, uh, significantly actually uh, affected the likelihood of the positive outcome. This is another actually, not necessarily a paper, a small abstract. Uh, I really wanted to put this just to kind of to show you when you use lower cutoff, 20 versus 30, and the upper cutoff, 70 versus 80, just because of depends on where you put those cutoff values. Uh, depending those cutoff values, the percentage of the mosaic embryo is reported anywhere from 4.9% to 17%, which there is actually 12% difference in between two numbers. So with this paper, the, 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 the assumption is it's not about like which next generation technology you are utilizing. It is the most important thing is where the, the cutoff will be placed. And due to high cutoff values, and the one genetic lab may have a higher euploidy uh, compared to other genetic lab uh, for obvious reasons, depends on where you put those thresholds. Um, this is another interesting paper that also show uh, the value of genetic testing uh, uh, PGTA. Um, time to time we uh, get requests to for rebiopsy embryos. Um, when you look at the specific paper, they look at the concordance between the first and second biopsy in mosaic embryo results. When they look at actually those uh, rebiopsy on euploid embryos, the concordance rate was quite high, like 9.5%, which is really amazing. And when they look at the unemployed result, they were also really quite high, which is 97.3%. But if you ever uh, do rebiopsy on mosaic embryos, the, the concordance rate is quite low, which is about 35.2%. If the first biopsy comes mosaic chromosome 5, and if you were to do another biopsy, you may get the same result or you may get like another maybe uh, mosaic chromosome. But that's the reason we are calling those embryos mosaic. Um, and that's why every time you do another biopsy, probably you may end up with a different uh, percentage. But that's why we call them uh, mosaic. And it's not about which result we should trust. All the result is correct. It's just the embryos by itself is mosaic. So after talking a lot of about uh, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, I would like to talk about pre-implantation genetic testing for single gene disorders. And uh, this is gonna be my next topic and the last topic. Um, so I would like to actually quickly go over overview about uh, what has been currently done for single gene disorders uh, in our field. So all the initial effort for single gene disorder is mainly done either with linkage analysis or direct mutation analysis, and actually often is combination of both. Um, but all the initial effort uh, uh, for the single gene disorder was done with the short tandem repeat, STR analysis. So as we know, the genome has exon, which is the coding region, and intron, which is non-coding region. And there are a lot of actually STR are located in the intron region. They are just keep repeating, some of the actually repeat can be uh, four base pairs, 
it can be like A C T A A C T A. Keep repeating a few times. Um, we don't know why they are even exist in the intron, but we have been using those for all different kind of purposes. STR short tandem repeat has been widely used for async application, but we are using STR analysis for linkage analysis in case uh, we want to do direct mutation analysis. It's just because of the DNA that we are working with required whole genome amplification. And unfortunately, whole genome amplification, there are some limitations. Some part of the genome may not work. And the part that we are interested in, if it doesn't amplify, then we have to be actually using linkage analysis to understand which homolog chromosome goes from parents to their embryonic level. Um, recently, single nucleotide polymorphism has been introduced to the R field. And this is mainly Illumina Infinium 2 SNP array. Um, and uh, this is called like uh, array-based linkage by cardio mapping. Uh, with this technology, this specific array consists of 300,000 SNP and uh, to be able to do the linkage analysis. So single nucleotide polymorphism actually more common than the SDRs in the genome. And it's estimated uh, four to five million SNPs can be found throughout the whole uh, genome that can be utilized for forensic application or any linkage analysis. And the last one that I want to discuss, which is the, the, the technology that I'm currently using through Thermo Fisher, it's called PGTSIC. And this is still SNP-based uh, uh, approach, but instead of using array platform, uh, we're going to be using a next generation sequencing uh, for linkage analysis. So I would like to start with linkage analysis with STR. Um, like as I mentioned before, uh, the STR analysis basically where uh, the, there are some repeats and every human being carry two chromosomes, one come from mom, one come from your dad. And with that specific example, let's assume that mom has ACC repeat. So this is only one STR marker that I would like to give an example. And as you can see, one of the allele with the mom has five repeats. ACC is repeating five times. The second allele for the same mom has in the second chromosome has seven uh, repeats. If you look at that, that has six and seven repeats. And again, this is only one STR marker that I'm talking about. So now the mom has heterozygous five, seven, and the dad is heterozygous six and seven repeats. So the possible alleles in the embryonic level would be either five to six, seven, sort of five to seven, six to seven, or seven to seven repeats. Those are the possible alleles in the embryonic level. So ideally, when we are going to do single gene disorder, we would like to sequence the disease mutation, and that will tell us what's going on in an embryonic level. Just because of you are using whole genome amplification, and just by chance, if that specific disease region that we're interested in is not amplifying, then we cannot actually give the answer about the embryonic level. And that's why we use linkage analysis with the STR testing to be able to understand which homolog chromosome coming from maternal site to the embryonic level and which homolog chromosome coming from that to the embryonic level. And based on using those, uh, the STR markers, we will be able to understand uh, the, uh, the embryonic level and whether or not the embryo is affected or carriers or completely healthy. Um, when it comes to STR analysis, uh, they are typically, uh, we typically develop six or seven STR, analysis, STR markers surrounding the disease mutation. So we try to be close, as, as close as possible to the disease mutation. And one of the reasons is to make sure that the, the crossover doesn't interfere with our resulting that cause possible misdiagnosis. Um, typically, six or seven STR is uh, usually utilized uh, for linkage analysis, and in some cases, combination of direct mutation analysis as well. Now, the second approach is linkage analysis with single nucleotide polymorphism for monogenic disorders. And one of the technology that has been widely used is carrier mapping. Uh, with this technology, um, instead of having repeats that are actually single nucleotide substitution, and there are approximately four to five million uh, SNPs that can be utilized throughout the whole genome. Um, and in this case, the mom is a GG allele and the dad has PT allele. And if you put them in the context of homozygous AA or homozygous BB, and you would be able to kind of find the possible uh, alleles in the embryonic level, whether or not they are AA, BB, or AB allele with the context of this uh, parent information. 
this again applies the same thing like uh, ideally we would like to sequence the disease mutation if we can but uh, in case we cannot really have really nice reading in that specific disease mutation then we would be using those SNP markers um, SNP markers actually has more frequency actually they are more common in the genome again compared to thousands of thousands of STRs we have actually over four or five million SNPs throughout the whole genome um, so as I mentioned in my previous slide, when we design STR markers, we try to be as close as possible to um, a disease mutation. But with the STR analysis, in some cases, we might not be get lucky and we may not be able to find those STR markers close by. But with the SNP, they're actually more powerful because there are like plenty of them uh, to use in the genome. And with this technology, with the carrier mappings, uh, we are actually able to find close to 30 single nucleotide polymorphism flanking region of the disease mutation. Obviously, it's better than having only five or six STR markers. Um, but uh, in case of allele dropout, in case of uh, we are not able to amplify some of the uh, DNA that we are trying to actually search for, um, half of the, the SNP markers may not work, which, which uh, would end up like getting only 15 or 10 SNP markers to work with, which is still not bad. But recently, actually before I actually jump into recent uh, NGS technology for SNP uh, analysis, I would like to just quickly a little bit go over uh, carrier mapping. With the carrier mapping, you have array, and this array, that specific type of array has a little bit over 300,000 SNP markers. But obviously we cannot use all the 300,000 markers because with this example, let's assume that mom and dad has the same condition and let's assume that this is a cystic fibrosis where cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive condition where the mom and dad has the same mutation and if you think everything is color coded in here so let's assume that the dad the, the chromosome actually the blue has affected chromosome and the mom the green one has actually affected chromosome which is depicted with the star so the on where the diamond or the star goes, the embryo could be completely affected or could be carrier like their parents or could be completely healthy. So it depends on where those stars or diamond goes, we'll be able to make the analysis in the embryonic level. Uh, but again, the most important part is when we look at those SNP markers, we need to be able to actually uh, be uh, as close as possible to the disease mutation. Uh, we cannot really kind of like uh, look at those SNP markers that are completely unrelated to chromosome. Um, one of the disadvantage with the carrier mapping is um, you are limited whatever is deposited in the array. So if you have any mutation, when you and when you look at the, the specific uh, coverage for that specific mutation, if you don't have enough uh, SNP markers, then you might actually have to use STR analysis to be able to kind of do the analysis. Uh, since there is not enough coverage for that specific mutation. Now, this is the one that I would like to discuss today, uh, linkage analysis with single nucleotide polymorphism for monogenic disease order uh, with PGTC. It is pretty much identical to SNP with array. The only difference is instead of using array, we're going to be using next generation sequencing. Why is important? Again, this is everything is applied to what I just explained previously. Uh, we try to do a uh, direct mutation analysis, but in many cases we'll probably fail or we're not going to get really crystal clear answers. So analy analyzing actually those SNP markers would be really important. And one of the advantage by using a pgt -seq is we can uh, develop a panel and we can put as many as SNP markers that we can put next to the disease mutation. And we typically have 200 SNP markers compared to only 30 or 40 markers with uh, array-based technology. And having multiple markers, obviously it increased our chance of having the confidence level or increased, uh, reduced the chance of having misdiagnosis for possible uh, due to uh, uh, crossover events. And this is how the workflow works, uh, how uh, the lab protocol works. Um, when we actually do the analysis, we use Coriol cell lines, and um, by analyzing the cell lines for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, 
in the uh, as soon as we do the cell lysis and uh, extracting the DNA, in the second step, which is the right after the preamplification, we can take three macroliter aliquot and we can continue in parallel for PGT6 for single gene disorder. And by the time we are done PGTA and PGTM, we will be able to do simultaneous analysis uh, for, from the same actually cell lines to be able to get the, the final answer for both. Um, and we also wanted to uh, understand what if actually we have a, a sample with Coriol cell lines that we did the verification, but the whole genome amplification already completed. Now, is there any way we can go back and we do the single gene disorder? Uh, this, the answer is yes. Uh, if the sample has been already done for an aneuploid screening, uh, we can always go back uh, from the third step, which is where we have the um, amplified library, all the barcoded barcode were already actually incorporated into the sample. Uh, if you take 20 microliter aliquot by purifying uh, the sample, by removing all the barcodes and primer dimers from the, the whole genome amplification, we will be able to actually continue with pre-implantation genetic testing for, with the pgt seq and we can still actually do the analysis, uh, which we did. And this is how the analysis works. And uh, this is, again, one of the sample that we received from Coriol cell lines to be able to understand how the linkage works. Uh, this specific example where uh, autosomal dominant disease, the male affected female uh, came negative from that specific cell line. And we had also maternal DNA from the male, which uh, the inheritance actually came from a maternal side. So everything is color coded. As you can see, female has completely grayed out and doesn't have the mutation. And male, the, 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 the blue one, the ones that doesn't carry the, the mutation and the orange one, the ones that carry the mutation. So when we did the analysis, and if you look at those, um, the Coriol cell line samples, what we found is the first three samples that had gotten one chromosome from a panel site, which is definitely negative, and depend on whether or not we get the blue or the orange, we will be able to make the calls whether or not they are carrier or actually affected. The first three samples, as you can see, uh, by chance, the unaffected chromosome was received from paternal site, but the other three samples, they all get actually the affected chromosome from a male uh, partner with the specific Coriol cell lines, which they are affected. So there's a very nice software that kind of tells you uh, what is going on for each SNPs. And this is just like a small screenshot. We typically screen 200 markers, uh, but this is the screenshot just only show you a few of them. And even if some of the SNP that doesn't work, when you work with 200 markers, even a half of them doesn't work, we still have like 100 markers to work with. So, um, just do this. One of the advantages using this NGS-based PGTM, first of all, the testing can be done uh, on the resource basis or any basis, uh, can be done with um, any mutation with the, uh, with the FIVA exception. Uh, the testing also can be done with the small deletions or insertions if there is a, a family pattern. And we could do simultaneous analysis for PGTA and PGTM from the same uh, specimen. And this is the list that we are able to do for any kind of genetic testing and mutation analysis, but we are not limited to anything that is listed in this uh, uh, disease mutation list. Uh, anytime there is any rate of mutation, we can develop the panel and we can actually target uh, 200 or a little bit over single nucleotide markers. And this is unlike with the array-based technology, if the, the disease mutation that we are looking in the array platform, if there is not enough SNP markers, then that requires to use STR analysis to be able to actually uh, do the testing. When it comes to next generation sequencing, uh, we are not actually dependent on which chromosome and which actually rare mutation. We can develop and we can actually target those SNP markers uh, based on the mutation and that we are receiving uh, from uh, any specimen. Um, the turnaround time is typically four to uh, four weeks to develop those panels, um, but 
one of the again advantage using PGT sick uh, for monogenic disorders is that uh, unlike the other technologies, we are using 200 markers uh, over 30 markers with cardio mapping or six markers with uh, STR linkage analysis. Um, but more importantly, there are some common diseases like such as cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, fragile X, osteogenesis imperfecta, and uh, alpha thalassemia. Those um, uh, diseases are quite common in the population, and um, there's pretty much like no waiting period for those testing. So those actually already ready in our laboratories. And if you want to do any testing in any sample, uh, we could easily actually perform without even a uh, waiting period, uh, as long as there is an informative family members that uh, can be utilized for linkage analysis. But of course, um, if there is uh, diseases are not covered in the five disease, we can definitely develop uh, any panel, and that uh, rare mutation uh, panel development takes anywhere between four to six weeks. And simultaneous analysis can be done with PGTA and PGTM from the same sample. And this is going to be my last slide. Um, we'll continue with using advantage of PGT sec. Um, we have those ready to use panels. And if the couple has any of those five disease or any, uh, the testing can be done easily uh, for any research base or any kind of analysis. And um, the, the one of the also biggest advantage with PGD technology, in order to, to develop those panels, we are not depending on the family members for the probe development. So the probe development can, be, can start independently. Again, unlike STR, in order to actually develop STR panel, we, um, the, the family members, are having the family members first to arrive to the lab is very crucial, which takes some time to collect those family members to be able to actually do the uh, linkage analysis. But pgt uh would be panel development can start as soon as uh, we would like to start, and the probe development will take anywhere from four to six weeks. And the hands-on time with the pgt it takes uh, only four hours, and just because of we have a liquid handler with iron shaft, and we will be able to do a majority of the work uh, without having actually people hands on. And most of the work will be done through the uh, liquid handler and also sequencing device, which is S5. And obviously, less uh, human involvement and less error. And I would like to thank uh, everyone again uh, who has attended to this meeting. And uh, if there's any question, I'm more than happy to take one. Well, thank you, Dr. Jana Olu, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. OK, let's get started. Our first question is, can DNA from amniotic sac be used as an amniocentesis rather than the DNA from the trophoectoderm of a blastocyst? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, yeah, any, any DNA material uh, can be utilized for either single gene disorders or uh, preimplanted genetics for aneuploidy. Um, Currently, uh, we did uh, an optical verification with Coriol cell lines, and uh, as long as the sample arc the, comes from amniotic fluid or CVS uh, chronic relay sampling, uh, yes, we can definitely work on those samples as well. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is, in labs, is this performed for checking some abnormalities in an embryo if the parent wishes to? Um, is this for a uh, single gene disorder or is this for, I need a little bit more clarification about the question if, or maybe if you repeat it again, maybe I can just have a better understanding. I can, I can repeat it again and then Nisa, if you want to clarify, you can type it in again. Is this performed for checking some abnormalities in an embryo if the parent wishes? Um, Yes, for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, uh, yes, we do this testing, uh, on, I mean, all the time. 
Um, and um, yes, as long as the parent wishes, and there's pretty much like uh, uh, all the requests can be accommodated easily. Okay, thank you. Um, and Nisa, if you need further clarification, we'll just type that in again, and we'll, if we don't have time today, we'll do that by email. The next question is, okay, if, if an individual performs PGTA, but later finds out one of the partners has PGTSR, do we need to do another biopsy, or could existing DNA be used for PGTSR testing? That's really, yeah, that's really great question. Uh, yes, the, there is no need for the second biopsy. The, the, the DNA sample that utilized for PGTA can be utilized for PGTSR, and there is no really need for rebiopsy. Um, and we just need to do actually a higher resolution which again, doesn't really require additional sampling from the same embryo, which is obviously is not ideal to biopsy embryo twice. Um, again, the short answer is yes, and can be done as R without any need for additional sampling from the same embryo. Okay, we've got time for one more question, uh, Dr. Jinolu. Uh, is the, okay, I'm not sure how to say this, is the lib prep manual or also automated? Um, pretty much uh, everything that I discussed today in here is we still use liquid handler, which is iron chef. So the handsome time, regardless of PGTA or PGTM, the handsome time approximately three to four hours. The whole protocol takes approximately 16 hours or 17 hours, depends on how many samples we are running. Uh, but in terms of the, the uh, liquid handler or in terms of like automation, it's pretty much the same. So we just only do a few hours hands-on and the rest is always automatic um, with the liquid handler um, devices. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Janolu. Do you have any final comments for the audience today? Um, yeah, I mean, those technologies is relatively new and uh, in like every other year or every year, although I've been in this year for a long time, Every year we learn new thing um, uh, from either uh, for any uh, research basis or any for uh, published paper. So uh, I have been actually in this field for the last 15 years, but again, even it makes me dizzy kind of to see all those kind of recent advances that's happening in our field, which I'm really pleased to see those. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Janolu, for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can also be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.